Here we are. All right. You are back on the Hoplite channel, and I am your host, Hop, and you clicked on this video to see Stoicism, Happiness versus Hedonism. What's the diff? So I uh, decided to go back once again uh, into Stoicism, because why not, right? It's a great topic. Uh, it's my uh, chosen um, philosophy as far as um, my, I guess you would say, path in life. I have decided that Stoicism makes the most sense to me, so why not share some more Stoic philosophy uh, with the viewer? Yeah, and I was going back through some of the videos that I'd done in the Stoicism series and realized that, you know, we talk about what the object of uh, Stoic philosophy is and you know, what, what, what are we doing here and why are we doing the things we do, uh, and it's happiness. And I, I've thought about it and I thought to myself, this is, um, this is fine, but, you know, what, what is happiness? It's one of those, those age-old questions that, you know, what's the purpose of life? Like, what is happiness? It's like, well, it's subjective depending on who you ask. But um, to make a distinction between uh, happiness and hedonism, which I think oftentimes gets confused, uh, this video hopefully will uh, explain what the Stoics and perhaps what I was trying to convey in my other videos in the Stoicism Primer series, uh, happiness being the object of Stoic philosophy and how you can tell if you're on the right path as far as happiness is concerned, whatever that path to happiness may be. Um, and I think hedonism, especially in today's uh, society and in today's age, um, yeah, the, the, the ever presence of hedonism confuses us and we often mistake things that are hedonistic for things that are quote unquote happy. Yeah. Um, in this uh, realm of social media, be it, you know, on YouTube or wherever, um, social media is an outlet, I, I believe, for hedonism. And we equate people's success on social media or what they portray as success or what they portray as pleasure as what we would think happiness looks like. Um, and I'm here to tell you, if you don't know yet, um, most of the things you see on social media uh, portray pictures of hedonism and not happiness, because happiness, as Stoicism would tell you, comes from within here and from up here. Hedonism comes from everywhere else, which would be the external to your, your body, right? So let's flesh out uh, the body, right? Let's flesh out the differences between happiness and hedonism, see if you agree and see if this list, this, this list of two different things helps you decipher things that lead to happiness and things that we mistake uh, happiness for and are in fact hedonistic. But anyway, let's first get a few definitions out of the way because that's what we're here to do, right? To find happiness and hedonism. Hedonism comes from the ancient Greek word for pleasure and it's uh, hedonismos. So uh, hedonism, yeah, it's just concerned with what is pleasurable and that all life forms seek to enhance pleasure and to avoid or at the very least mitigate pain or suffering. That's fair, right? And you would say that all life forms, without exception, you know, seek to do that. Uh, I have a bulldog and um, he's a good example of this. Um, he, he, he thinks hedonism is happiness, but he doesn't have, you know, the, the complex circuitry up here to tell the difference. Uh, when he was a puppy, I would uh, feed him uh, regular intervals uh, each day, like in uh, one bowl in the morning and one bowl at night. Uh, and every time, without fail, he would devour the bowl as fast as he could. And he would look to me for like more. And I had to get a slow feed bowl for him so that he paced himself, right? Because if it were up to him, and he could, you know, walk on two legs and had opposable thumbs. When I was gone, he would probably walk to wherever I kept the dog food and just empty the bag and literally eat himself into 
uh, comatose uh, bliss. I know that for a fact. And you probably have, if you have a dog, you know that too. Dogs would eat themselves to the point of, you know, sickness or uh, just immo immobility. This is hedonistic. But he doesn't know the difference, right? He eats this food. This food gives him this endorphin rush, like this tastes good. This is going to fill our belly. Keep going, keep going. There's no mitigation. There's no, um, there's no self-check when it comes to a dog and uh, food. They'll just go. Um, and they'll just eat until they can't eat anymore. So I had to give him a slow, slow feed bowl, number one, so he didn't like get bloat or you know, you know, kill himself from you know, eating food so fast he inhaled it. But slow feed bowl taught him to like, just pace yourself whether you want to or not. This is, this is the way you're gonna have to eat because this is safer. This will make you happy, believe me, trust me. Um, I'm sure, like I said, if he could talk and if he could walk, he would just empty the whole bag on the floor and eat it until he couldn't fill it into his stomach. So yeah, all life forms seek to enhance pleasure, mitigate or avoid pain. And most life forms would do this because pain we uh, associate with death. If, you, if you're going through pain or suffering, th these are little tidbits of what death could possibly be. This hurts. Uh, this this is cold. This is this is hot. I want to get out of the heat. I need to get out of the cold. I need to avoid what gives me pain because I believe this pain, if it goes unchecked, will be the end of me. So I avoid that, and I seek pleasure. I seek the sun because it's it's sunny out and it's pleasant. Or maybe I go out and I play in the snow because that's fun to do when you know there's snow on the ground. But I don't seek these extremes. I don't stay out in the sun too long and roast, and I don't stay out playing in the cold until I freeze. Uh, th these are things I want to avoid, but I also want to take pleasure in things that I can take pleasure in while I can. Nothing wrong with that. So a big advocate of this frame of mind, this lifestyle, was uh, a man by the name of Epicurus. Yeah. So he advocated hedonism. And he came up with this Epicurean style of philosophy uh, in around, around 307 BC, which was not too, you know, not too far removed from when Stoicism became its own philosophy as well. And Epicurus uh, taught that the greatest goods in life uh, were uh, when you sought pleasure modestly. Now, that's, that's a big, uh, I think, uh, con confusion that exists with uh, hedonism and Epicur uh, Epicureanism is that hedonism uh, does not really consider modesty. Epicurus would say modest pleasure seeking is good. And in order to attain uh, this in order to attain a state of tranquility, this modest pleasure seeking uh, would provide freedom from fear, which they referred to as ataraxia, and the freedom from bodily pain, which was uh, aponia. So uh, ataraxia and aponia, fear and bodily harm, avoid and seek modest pleasure whenever you can. So how do you live this Epicurean lifestyle? Well, if it feels good, do it. Do it often. And if it feels bad, avoid it whenever possible. So just live life simply. Good things uh, feel good, therefore you should do them. Bad things feel bad, therefore you should avoid them. Uh, the problem here is the Stoics would say, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, that sounds like life on autopilot. Where does virtue and the exercise of reason uh, what we call logos, where does that come into play? Are we just supposed to fill our bellies with food and wine and uh, you know, uh, attend uh, orgies every day, uh, lay out in the sun and um, eat grapes and maybe you know, play our lyre and uh, recite poetry? Uh, that sounds like a, a, a sedentary life of leisure. There has to be more. Where is the logos? Where is the reason? Epicurus wasn't, wasn't interested in this. Uh, the, the reason the Logos was in the good, which was the pleasure. So if you find goodness in pleasure, that's all the reason you need. Just reason out what you find pleasurable and what you find displeasurable and make your decisions based upon those two. Very simple, but that was Epicurus. Live life simply. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks and why the Stoics would disagree with this philosophy and why there's a difference and why Epicurus, according to the Stoics, didn't quite get it right. So as we said in the primer series, the Stoics would say the purpose of life is happiness.
you want to be happy, you want to live a life that you would consider happily lived. And happiness is found through the virtues, right? Through virtue we find happiness. And virtue is only found through philosophy, the pursuit of truth, using your reason, your logos, to determine what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is just, what is unjust, and separating those two uh, distinct categories. And then using virtue to live a life that will put you on a path to attaining lasting happiness. But what is happiness? We're still there. Like, okay, this is fine. This formula makes sense to me, but tell me what it is. So we know that happiness is something that comes from the mind and the mind alone. And people would say, well, well happiness is a state of mind. Some people say, well, happiness actually isn't a state of anything. It's just the journey you go on trying to pursue the very thing you claim to be looking for that you have as you take it with you. Uh, going on a journey uh, to a certain location, people would say the location is fine and once you get there you're happy, but it was the journey itself that made that location worthwhile. Okay, but we know that happiness is this, is this state of mind, it's this frame of reference, and it's, it's only something you can give yourself, right? People cannot give you happiness. They can give you money, they can give you clothes, they can give you a car, they can give you a house, they can give you a job. That's fine, but just because that object or those goods or that currency is in your possession doesn't necessarily equate happiness. Happiness has to come from up here, and some people are, very, are happy with very little, and some people are happy with only uh, a mountain of wealth and a fortune. It just depends on their frame of mind. Hedonism is from the body only, right? So hedonism is something that stimulates the mind, but it comes from the external as it pertains to your body. Uh, sex is pleasurable. It's, it's something you enjoy through the body. Food is pleasurable. Delicious, yummy food, right? Who doesn't like to talk about delicious food and how, how fun it is to delete, yum, to delete, to, to eat delicious food and to drink delicious uh, drinks, uh, to uh, binge drink alcohol, to uh, use recreational drugs to the point where you're stoned out of your head. This is all hedonism and this is all from the body. These things don't really require your state of mind. They affect you in the physical corporal sense and just take over. There's no thought left. I mean, there's no thought involved. All you have to do is perform the act or take the substance and there you go. So happiness uh, is a state of contentment. And again, from the mind, this is the state of contentment where you're just content. You're fine with the way things are. Um, maybe you could have more, maybe you could have less, but what you have right now is enough for you and you're at peace. You're in this, what I guess Epicurus would say, this state of tranquility. But he would say your tranquility has to come from the pleasure you receive from the world around you. Whereas the Stoics would say, no, no, the, the, the pleasure you see, receive from the world around you is fine, but it cannot be the source of contentment because only that comes from the mind. And only your mind can use reason to determine whether or not this is your state of content. Okay, and excess is, of course, the state of hedonism. There has to be more, right? I have to get that new rush. I have to get that new high. I have to uh, try that new restaurant or drive that new car or I have to uh, date that new man or date that new woman. It's excess. It's always one short of where it needs to be. And that's the point of hedonism is just if you're pursuing these pleasures as best you can, whenever you can, then you are always just one shy of what you need. And it, there's never a state of contentment. It's just excess. So yeah, uh, going along with that, it's fleeting because excess is fleeting, right? You get high on Monday and you come down on Tuesday. You get wasted on Friday and you're hungover on Saturday. You drive that car and eventually that car either runs out of gas or you get bored with it. Uh, that new person you're dating, all of a sudden they don't really have the same uh, appeal they had when you met them a month ago, so you just rinse, wash, and repeat. It's fleeting. It doesn't last. It, uh, it's something that just has to be uh, perpetually on a cycle of new item, uh, pleasure, boredom, uh, new item. And just that circle keeps going. Uh, with sustainability, it's 
new item, pleasure, contentment, and contentment takes you from there around the circle. Uh, happiness is uh, expensive. Uh, I, I meant to say expensive, not in the sense necessarily of, uh, of how much it costs you in wealth, but it requires an investment. Happiness is something that uh, is not easily attained because again, if it comes from your mind and it relies on you being content, uh, it's not something that will come overnight and it's not fleeting and it's something that is uh, sustainable. But things that are sustainable that require contentment are also often things that require your long-term investment. Uh, happiness in your social life. You uh, spent several years meeting different people and acquiring your circle of friends. Some friends you had to let go, some friends you brought into the circle, but this is now your circle of friends. You've invested in these people. You're of the same mind. These people will give you happiness. They do, they're not just coming and going. They're, they're here to stay. Same thing with your immediate life. If you have... Um, uh, a spouse and kids. You invest in those things because if you nurture it, it will give you sustainable happiness. Uh, if you invest in a property and you improve that property, you build structures on it. Uh, if you own a farm and you raise crops, that's an investment. And you can look back on that investment once it pays off for you and find contentment and happiness in that. Hedonism is cheap. It's, it's a weekend at Vegas, right? You, you, you jam all the cash you can fit into your pockets you know, you drive down uh, the Death Valley Freeway, and then when you get to Vegas, you just splurge, right? You roll the dice, you spin the wheel, you play the cards, right? You go to the bar and you try to pick up the chick. You spend a bunch of money uh, on drinks. You get the hotel room, and then when you wake up in the morning, you're broke and it's all over. None of that was really an investment. It was just an investment for the immediate sense, for that immediate pleasure. So it was cheap. Yeah, you might have spent a lot of money in that short time frame, but it wasn't as expensive as, you know, acquiring friends over the course of a decade or working on a farm that was dilapidated and broken down and pouring all of your blood, sweat, and money into something like a property just to 10 years finally see it bear you fruit. That's expensive. The weekend at Vegas is expensive for that couple of hours, but it's cheap because it doesn't compare to what the long-term investment of lasting happiness would be like. And happiness, uh, because it's expensive and sustainable, it's transmissible. You can give it to other people. For example, the farm, like I said, if you have a family and you buy this farm and it's a complete failure, I mean, the barn's falling apart, the, uh, there's no animals, the, the crops won't grow, but you till the earth, you put in the time and effort to make sure the ground is now suitable for raising uh, vegetables and fruits. You bring in animals and livestock and they help sustain the farm as well. You build the barn, right? You raise it, you, you make it brand new. And then when you are ready to hand it over to your family, this, free, this freedom you have in the transmissibility of happiness as a parent. It's like, I have put my life's work into this farm. You were there when, when I built it. It gave us years of happiness. I now give it to you and may it give you many more years of happiness as well. That's something you can give somebody else. If they find contentment and they can sustain that happiness in inheriting that farm, then yeah, the ha happiness has been transmitted from one person to the other. Hedonism is solitary only, right? Nobody else is going on that trip to Vegas with you and having the same experience you are. You might have friends next to you or new acquaintances from the bar, but when you roll that dice, that's all up here, that, that endorphin rush from you know, hitting lucky seven. When you uh, pull that lever for the, uh, um, the slot machine and it comes up you know, three bar, you feel that. You see that money come out in the, in the coins and then you take that money to the bar then you blow it there on booze and whatever. That's all for you, right? You can't share that with somebody else. You're drinking that alcohol. You're pulling that lever. You're playing those cards. You're spinning that wheel. When it's over, it's over. And what, what can you tell somebody or what can you give them? Maybe you could give them the winnings you, you made if you did win in Vegas, which is probably pretty rare because 
if you've ever, ever been to Vegas and looked around, that place didn't get to be what it is because guys like you went there and won it all. Uh, usually quite the opposite. But if you do win money, it's like, what do you do? You just, you just hand, you transmit the money. It's like, here's the money I made on that crazy win streak I had in Vegas last week. May it give you happiness too. That, that, that money is just, that could come from anywhere. So that you can't really transmit that feeling because the hedonistic pleasure you, you had in that moment was for you and for you alone. The, transmiss, the, the transmissibility of happiness, like I said, requires the investment and it's expensive and it's sustainable. Therefore, it can be uh, deeded, I guess you would say, for like, or, or lent to somebody else or perhaps just given as a gift. And because of all these things, happiness is something that feels right. It feels good because it feels right. And that is because of virtue. Things that are virtuous, if you're a decent person and you know the difference between honesty and dishonesty, between love and lust, between uh, spite and vengeance and, um, and righteousness, uh, all these things that uh, can be discerned if you have proper logos and reason, if you choose the side of virtue and you are content with your life and the things you acquire in life or the people you meet, this feels right because you got to this place on account of virtue. It doesn't just feel good, it feels correct. Hedonism, on the other hand, feels good and that's when you know it's a vice. If you look back at something that gave you pleasure and you said, I'm happy because of this, are you really? Are you happy because of this good or are you happy because of this good feeling like it's right? If you feel as though something is good and that's all you can say about it, that's how you know it was hedonistic. If you have something that feels good and you can say that it's a just good, it's a right kind of good, then you know it was true happiness. It's something that was acquired uh, by virtue. And I think Epicurus wasn't interested in Stoicism because he looked at mankind more or less like upright apes. We're animals. At the end of the day, we are just the same as uh, any other mammal in the uh, animal kingdom. It's just that we have the ability of complex and abstract thought. But if you take that away, we're just hairless monkeys, right? So why make our lives any more complex than pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain? And then just letting that be our, our motivating force. The Stoics, because of our abstract thinking and because of our complex thought, decided, well, whatever the reasons may have been for this, this up here is a gift, whether it comes from God or from nature, and it cannot be abused or flat out not used at all. So giving yourself over to hedonistic vices, pleasures, and not really bothering to determine whether or not there's any virtue in these goods, in these, in these pleasurable things, is not, it's barely half the battle. So the Stoics think, and I believe they are correct, that the purpose of life is happiness. Uh, Epicureans would agree with you. However, happiness is found through virtue. And that is the only way you can determine happiness from hedonism. Is my state of happiness with me on account of a virtue or my pursuit, my pursuit of those virtues? And did I use philosophy, the pursuit and the love of truth, of wisdom, to get to those virtues in the first place? If you can't say yes to either of these, you're probably just enjoying some good old-fashioned hedonistic fun. And that's all there is to it. Okay. I just uh, I felt like this was something I needed to do for the Stoicism series because we talk about happiness, uh, eudaimonia, uh, but you know what is it really, and how do you tell the difference? Uh, there's so much hedonism in the world. Uh, there's very few people who can say they are truly happy and mean it. Most people will just throw their lives into excess, and uh, hedonism becomes their only mode of happiness. And you can see them having to go one day further or one, one high extra or one um, experience more to say they're happy, but they're never really there. This is, this is the path of, of the, the hedonist, of the uh, Epicurean. I am in the pursuit of pleasure, 
Therefore, I am always one day short. I am always one experience shy of happiness because excess is all there is. Um, the Stoic knows this is not sustainable. Happiness is sustainable. It's contentment and it comes from the mind. And that is really all you have control over. You really don't even have control over your own body. Your body will respond to these things whether you want to or not. Um, but it's your mind that you have full, full agency over. And that's why happiness is greater than hedonism. It is your mind telling you there's a difference and it will feel right uh, when you get there. Okay, cool. Uh, once again, Hoplite Channel, Stoicism, Hedonism uh, versus happiness, happiness versus hedonism, what's the difference? And I think right here, uh, this explanation hopefully will, will give you a little bit of a clue as to... Uh, what the differences are between the two. And maybe you yourself say, hey, I've been pursuing mostly a hedonistic life now. I, I really have to reassess what I'm doing and uh, take a step back and see what is hedonistic and, and what, is, what is truly happy and focus on the things that make me happy and try to lessen or perhaps do away with things that are purely hedonistic uh, for their own sake. Okay. Uh, once again, Hoplite Channel here, Stoicism. This will go in the playlist. Uh, if you uh, are a subscriber, thanks a lot. If you're liking the channel, you could always use more subscribers. Uh, hit the like button if you like uh, Stoicism or these topics. And yeah, uh, happiness versus hedonism. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll go into a uh, video on Epicureanism because uh, I just talked about Epicurus here and I think maybe a series for him could be in the works uh, just so people have... Uh, the ability to see Stoicism versus a, another contemporary, uh, for 300 BC, another contemporary form of philosophy that existed at the time. Okay, uh, once again, thanks for coming by, and uh, we'll see you next time. Till then, take it easy.